here we go. We're going to get to tonight's presentation and uh, the introduction. Okay. I don't really have an introduction. I spent like, God, how many hours? Ten hours together? This guy's good. He is really good, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear the presentation. I requested an executive summary from him, which he was gratefully provided and put together, and that's been on the email, so hopefully you can... Okay, let's, let's just move on. Okay, so uh, anyway, what I would like to do is I'd like to introduce you to GR Mobley, and he will tell you more about himself as the presentation progresses. Big hand. So I repeat myself when under stress, I repeat myself when under stress. So we're good, we're working. And I don't see what I need to see. There's something I need to see up there. Is this right? This is my clicker. <clears throat> Before I really get started into this meaty presentation, I wanted to, and it is meaty, um, and I'm going to really breeze through this as fast as I possibly can, but I wanted to thank the Northwest Grassroots for having me and uh, giving me an opportunity to really fire hose a lot of people tonight. Um, I do have my books here, and the majority of the proceeds of the sale of the book will actually go to the Northwest Grassroots. So I'm not really going to make that much money on it. I don't like doing book tours and peddling, and as a matter of fact, when I do things like this, I always give the proceeds to the host organization because I know that they're sitting there and I'm just going to be making them sick by you know, going through the Constitution and how bad it really is. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I do have a radio show in Spokane. It's on AM 1230, and I'm right now during your evening commute from 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, and hopefully we'll be growing that into uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays as well within the next few months with sponsorship support and so forth. So without any further ado, what I have here is the irrefutable argument for Republic Review. Republic Review is a term that I came up with with another constitutional scholar that is a play on judicial review because the Supreme Court says that they want to have the power to be able to pull in throughout the Republic a case that they think that might be worthy of their view even though it's outside of the constitutional jurisdiction. But Republic Review actually is an inherent right, and we are a republic, and the republic has the authority, and I will get into this, in actually uh, overseeing the Constitution. So, let me turn myself on, and here we go. Oh. So I have some fundamental premises. Reasonable people, equally informed, seldom disagree. The problem is that middle part equally informed. We have a lot of people that don't necessarily have the same level of information. The second premise is knowledge is power. I think everybody understands and as soon as you start understanding what you need to be doing, then you become a little more powerful and knowledge is also dangerous. And so the third part of this is that, and this is a, basically a phrase from Madison, and I think it was common knowledge back in the framers' days, that people are the fountain of political power. And so tying these three things together, becoming equally informed and becoming knowledgeable in the right ways of truly understanding the actual academic applications of the Constitution and getting back into what the framers gave us will help us concentrate our power as the fountain of power because the people are the fountain of power. And the problem with our representation, if any of them are still left, that are back in DC or back, not in DC, back in Olympia and DC if Kathy was here, is that we redirect them in so many different ways. So I want to go through this, and I want you to keep this in mind, that there are so many distractions that are causing our problems, that we're not focused and succinct in the message that we want our representatives to save us from federal tyranny. So if you didn't know, the Constitution was written for and by the states. It didn't just come up from the Potomac and it didn't just come from a good rainfall out in the field. The states sent delegates and the states had to ratify this. 
And so one of the unique things about our Constitution is that the sovereignty was actually evenly distributed. The majority of the power obviously rests with the people, but the states are really the overseers, and we're the ones that are supposed to be controlling the states. So if you can grasp that, then Article 7 should make sense if you know what Article 7 is, it's the ratification process. Article 7 identifies who the stakeholders are of the Constitution. Who was it? It was the states. And the 13 original states are the real stakeholders and all states that came in basically became equal stakeholders in that same Constitution. So Washington is a part of the stakeholders and owners of this Constitution. It's not the federal government, it's not the Supreme Court. They are the highest authority and sovereigns in the world over the world's greatest government. Do you fathom that? I hope so. So if you understand this ratification clause, which is a part of Article 7, ratification is the official and formal acceptance of a contract. Basically, it's pointing out that this Constitution is a contract. Madison said this. Jefferson said this. All the framers interchanged compact, constitution, and contract. They were interchangeable several times. In many of their writings, they referred to it as compacts and contracts. That being said, the ratification process didn't just happen in a bubble, nor was it an up and down vote where everybody just voted, yeah, we're going to accept this. Guess what? In contract law, if you understand um, what, what happens when you're negotiating a contract, the negotiations of that contract actually become legally binding. If you understand that I say that this line means this, and you, sir, have given me this contract that you've written, and you say, no, this is exactly what it means, and you write that down, that's legally binding to what that contract means. And that's exactly what happened during these ratification debates. But I'll get into that a little sooner. But what the Constitution actually did do in these two things, these two bullets here, at the very bottom, is it delegated very specific powers to the federal government. This is all they can do. Nothing more. This is what we delegate to you to do. That second one, that second bullet, is what basically the states have retained. Basically giving them supremacy on all things not delegated. Healthcare, not delegated. The states are supreme in that. Everything that we really understand that the federal government is doing, over 80%, as I say in my executive summary, is unconstitutional. These are the delegated powers. I think it's really important I put them up here. We're just going to fly through these. I'm not going to read these. And at the very bottom, you'll notice the blue words will denote the um, commonly used usurpations that the federal government uses, or as, or as far as the clauses, Commerce Clause, General Welfare Clause, Necessary and Proper Clause, and the Supremacy Clause. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to say this at the very end, that all of these slides I'm putting up will be in PDF format on my website. And you know, if Northwest Grassroots has a website as well, but I have reclaimingtherepublic.org and mobiustrippress.org. They'll all point to the, uh, where you can get these. And if you follow me on Facebook, I'll announce it as soon as I get these things up. So that way you can actually go through this and you know, garner more because I'm not reading these for you. And, I don't have the time because I, I understand opportunity costs and I really appreciate you being here. So this is page one of the delegated powers. This is article one, section eight. Here's page two of the delegated powers. Oversight is an inherent vehicle in a contract. If you have a subcontractor that is failing to execute as you've told them and they've taken privileges or latitude in the contract, you have the power to go in and say, we did not give you this or delegate these powers to you and you can actually kick them out or you can get them back into the framework if they want to behave well. That's the power the states have. And in the ratification, as I said this before, 
the mediations, negotiations, and everything that they clarified are legally binding. So here's why John Marshall did not want to have these things as a part of their standard. He never cited the ratification debates. Why? Because he knew it was said because he was at the Virginia ratification debate and it would have tied his hands to saying, well, I guess the federal government isn't supreme in these particular cases or in all things as he did later and I'll get into that. So therefore, the, uh, the states are the principal stakeholders of the Constitution, and they have the ability to actually step in at any point in time because it is inherent of oversight and control in any contract. If you are the stakeholder, you can step in at any point and take over. So the modification process is another thing that supports this. Who has the power to make any changes to the Constitution? Can the Supreme Court come along and say, we want to grant the ability to, to give abortions. No, they can't. It's well outside their jurisdiction. They don't have the power to make those changes, but they do it because we've been told that they can. Marshall created these precedents a long time ago, but the Article 5 process clearly states who is the arbiter, or I should say, who is the final arbiter of what becomes constitutional and what isn't constitutional. It's the states. It requires three-fourths of the states to allow something to be changed to the Constitution. Not the President, not Congress, nor the Supreme Court. The states have that kind of power. So, if we move forward real quick, and I set up these facts of precedence, if you look at what the federal government did right out the gate, right after the Constitution was signed, they set up a precedence of obeying the Constitution. Imagine that. They actually lived by it because they amended the Constitution 12 times while, they, while the framers were still alive. And as a matter of fact, if you look at this 12th Amendment, the 12th Amendment, or I'm, I'm sorry, is it the 12th? Yeah, it's the 12th Amendment because that was the Jefferson-Adams debate over the Electoral College because it took 80 votes to finally get the president seated uh, to be Jefferson. And so they changed the Electoral College. So they made a minute change to Article 2 and they amended the Constitution for that. Guess what? We're not even following that because Congress took it upon themselves to say we can create statutes and regulations now and change how we do our Electoral College. And that's why we're not doing it per of Article 11, or I should say, per the 12th Amendment. So let me give you a little pitch on the, our federal government. If everybody doesn't know, the president is the executive and he's supposed to faithfully execute the laws. Not create laws, execute. He has, a, he has the biggest stake in foreign policy and to me that's one of the most important things is what is his foreign policies. Congress is supposed to legislate and create the laws that are pertinent to the enumerated powers, not create new powers. And the best part is the Supreme Court is supposed to be the guardians. They're supposed to protect the Constitution from encroachments, from uh, encroachments from the legislation or encroachments from the executive. And if you read the Federalist Papers, one would think that these guys were holy men, that they would have been holy men, but they're not, and they're obviously very corruptible. Bottom line, the states have, and it's incredible that the states have this ability, and I, as I say it down here at the very bottom, this contractual authority that the states possess cannot be usurped, delegated, or abdicated voluntarily or by force. It has to be changed per the Constitution and the constitutional process, and the states are asleep at the wheel. So the Constitution has been under attack for a long time, and in 1803 was the first time by the judiciary with judicial review. The first time by Congress that was really egregious was 18, um, 1817 with, no, it was, yeah, it was 1817 with Madison, I'm sorry. I've just got all these other numbers. 1849 was the year that they actually successfully created an unconstitutional department called the Department of Interior which is the BLM. We got a problem with those guys? Okay, so that is an unconstitutional department. And in 1829 was the first time the president really stepped over his bounds and actually persecuted people such as the Trail of Tears. This was Andrew Jackson when he actually started reigning with some tyranny. He got some things right, but he was our first living king, overstepping his bounds, and we've had nothing but kings since. So the judiciary has used 
these four clauses to usurp the state's powers. And if you go through the language of the Constitution, the language of the Federalist Papers, the Constitutional Convention, ratification debates, and so forth, it does not jive with what John Marshall said. The four clauses, in actuality, really, and as a matter of fact, let me jump to this Commerce Clause, which is the third one down. There's this thing called regulate, and people read in the commerce, what, they're supposed to regulate commerce? No. Back then, the definition of regulate meant put in good order. That was the common use, and as a matter of fact, they didn't have heavy regulations and heavy-handed tactics of government. If you look, they were a laissez-faire, not involved at all, unless there was a direct dispute between one state or another, or in contracts and so forth. Um, as far as the necessary and proper clause and all of these other ones, there's a real good document I'm going to get to real, real quick here. But these are the seven landmark cases. I believe it's seven up there, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So, so there's seven. I know that a few people point to eight and nine. But these to me are the real seven landmark cases that John Marshall used to create rulings that what he ended up doing was created unconstitutional footings for people to come in later because he injected precedence in case law. The Constitution does not allocate precedence in case law. Do you understand that? So in other words, because this happened or somebody said something, we, build, we believe we can make a decision in favor of doing this. No, it's either in the Constitution or not, and that's how they're supposed to read it. There's no case law allowed in the Constitution. And then if you read the ratification debates, they were very clear. Had that been a part of the Constitutional Convention and the ratification debates, I'm telling you, the 13 states would have rejected it because they would have recognized that the judiciary would have had way too much power to be able to start moving decisions and amending the Constitution or making things constitutional. So in 1817, this is a very interesting story. Madison was just getting out of his presidency. He had a conversation sometime in late January, early February the, with his colleagues from Congress, because he worked in Congress for a long time. And they wanted to know what, he, what they could do to create a hallmark bill that would, you know, just make his, you know, his legislation, right? Like Obamacare, his legislation. And so he said, you know, the one thing that this nation really needs is the ability to move commerce from the hinterland to the ports and back and forth. And if we could move commerce, commerce more efficiently, that we would be an economic power that no one in the world could reckon with. And he was absolutely correct. They went across those the aisle or they went down you know Pennsylvania's Avenue and they created their legislation they came back with what was called the bonus bill and this bonus bill was vetoed by Madison and they were really insulted by this fact and you know what the Madison Monument is in Washington the Library of Congress <laughs> that's the edifice for the father the guy we call the father of the Constitution because obviously they were a little upset um, but the fact is, is that if you read this one veto, and I say it right here, this is likely the most powerful one-page document written since the of dawn and since now to this day for this republic because he squashes these four clauses in this one veto. He basically says that the supremacy clause, the commerce clause, the necessary and proper clause, and the general welfare and defense clauses only pertain to the enumerated powers within the Constitution. These are not portals to granting new powers. This is Madison saying this. And so I invite you to read this if you haven't read my executive summary and all the citations. This is in my first book as well. So bottom line, they weren't supposed to do this. Well, they tried again in 1822 with James Monroe, and then they tried again in 1830 with Andrew Jackson, and both of those presidents vetoed what was going to be the Department of Transportation. All three said you have to amend the Constitution if you want to have a Department of Transportation. Well, seems to me, folks, we've got one. Please show me the amendment. We have two framers and a, you know, a, a Johnny-come-lately President Jackson, but still, we got the precedents, and they said that we had to do this, so who's right? Who has the, who, who has the accuracy on this? Who's nader on this point, right above the accuracy on this? And I'm going to tell you, it's Madison, because he knew. So if you remember that government picture that I had before, 
those top lists up there, if you look, interior, agriculture, those are all unconstitutional powers that were created via these clauses. Interesting. None of them have gone through the Article 5 process. And as a matter of fact, if you notice, there's a little blue box above the form of government. That is supposed to be the state's oversight to make sure that nothing gets created to weigh upon the republic. It has to be done within the confines of the Constitution, which is that kind of beige area that I have the Constitution barrier. So for them to create anything, it has to be within the Constitution, and they didn't do that. So in a macro, we have 15 executive departments, 585 agencies, offices, blah, 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 blah. Over 80% of them are unconstitutional. Now, I don't know if that's arbitrary, but to me, that definitely qualifies as federal tyranny. We didn't grant them these powers through the constitutional process. So the problem is really not about immigration. The problem isn't about abortion and all of these other education. You name it, you call it what you want if, what, if it's your passion. But I'm telling you the problem is truly compliance to the Constitution. All of these problems that everybody's passionate about, remember I was talking about that fountain of power. There's so many people that are caught up on whatever their passion of the day is or the problem du jour. The problem du jour should be one thing and one thing alone, compliance to the Constitution. That's it. If we focus on that, all these other problems are going to go away. And this is our monster, and there's the focus. If we start focusing on the monster instead of these little arms, because they've truly created a leviathan. So I think this is a great picture to kind of show all the different arms that they've grown that have been unconstitutional. If any of those are up there that are your passion, then I would basically say, Let's redirect your passion and focus down to the, what the real problem is, and that's the monster. If you want to get rid of these things, you have to kill the monster. So the Constitution is very clear. It gave the sole responsibility to the states. The framers knew exactly what they were doing. And again, it's not given to the president and is not given to Congress and it's not given to the Supreme Court. So what do you do when a contract is being violated? And again, who's that ultimate authority that we can go to? There you go. It's an audit. It's a contract. It's inherent. We can audit the Constitution that simple. As a matter of fact, I floated this out, and if you listen to my radio show today, I talked to Dr. Weil, who's the Dean of Honors for Middle Tennessee University, and he's the Dean of the Political Science Department. And he doesn't necessarily like my idea because he's an academic, and I, I, I have a lot of respect for this guy. He really understands the ins and outs and knows a lot more than me, but he doesn't argue the fact that this, the states don't have this power. He just do, would not want to see this because he believes that there would be an anarchy, um, there'd be anarchy that might follow from this. Or there may be other problems, or there's precedents and so forth. But again, giving him the due respect of being an academic, I, I, I give him that. But there's lots of others that don't like this as well because they think, oh, we can't do this. We've got to educate everybody. So I'll get into how we do this, but this is what we really have to do. We must audit the Constitution, getting all the states involved, because we've got to remember, it's our contract. So conducting an audit, um, an audit is one of those things that we can actually get down by going, or uh, the basis of the audit is one of those things that we just basically have to follow the Constitution. Was the Constitution followed in creating any new roles, responsibilities, and powers? So we have to go through all of these existing roles, responsibilities, and powers and define that's constitutional, that's not constitutional. So here's the 12 executive departments that have been created since the framers created the first three, the defense, treasury, and state. So here's the other 12. Was the Article 5 process followed for them to have these delegated powers, are these usurped? Well, you won't find any amendments, folks. 
So the key points to remember is Article 7 truly defined who the stakeholders were of the Constitution. It is in the Constitution who had to buy in. It had nothing to do with corporations or the federal government because it didn't exist. It required the states. Article 5 gives the states the power to dictate what is constitutional, what isn't. And because they passed these 12 departments under our nose and we've been sleeping at the wheel, I'm just here waking you up. I'm just here stating the obvious. We have the ability to challenge these as the republic as we move forward. And so auditing the contract again is the obvious thing that we have to do. And it can start with one state. One. So eventually all states, once, an, once one state gets this going, all states are going to get into the game because they have skin in the game. And the audit is only an administrative function. So those of you who think that the exerting state power will lead to a very decimating thing to the Constitution, not at all. If you understand what an audit is, an audit is to protect that document, protect the contract, right? And so when I talk about a convention for republic review, I'm not talking about a convention that's going to amend, write, rewrite, make any modifications. It's basically an audit of looking at what the Constitution says and what you're doing and going, you're not supposed to be doing these things. You're going to have to cease and desist. These are going to have to come back to the states. And the states will be the sovereigns and decide what they want to do. If you want a veteran's affair, then we have to amend the Constitution. As a veteran, I would love to see that become constitutional. But it's unconstitutional. Bottom line. So we have to strictly go against the norm of accepting what they're doing because they're supreme. And we have to start looking in the paradigm that we are the supremes over whatever is constitutional and what isn't. So when we get one state to initiate the con or this audit and this convention process. What it does is it's going to establish authenticity and reestablish the authority that the states have in this constitution. You get that? They're going to reestablish their authority once again because the federal government has basically taken the role that they are the supreme in all things. Read the Washington State Constitution. It says that the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Then why is it that the state of Washington is following all these unconstitutional things that aren't in the U.S. Constitution? Hmm. So when we get the first state, it's going to call upon all the other states. And as a matter of fact, I, folks, this has happened before. You know who did this the first time in trying to call an audit? Anybody read my executive summary? Madison and Jefferson with the Sedition Acts tried to stand up and called all the states to say this is a constitutional violation of the First Amendment. They cannot regulate speech. And that's exactly what they did with the Sedition Act. And so they sent out an appeal to all the states saying, please join us in admonishing and setting the federal government right. Well, the other states didn't want to play along. That wasn't their fault at this point. But we cannot afford not to sit on our hands anymore. And I'm telling you, there's more than enough states that when they get this and when they start cogitating, ruminating, and, and digesting this information, why is it that, you know, they haven't started this sooner? The convention in auditing the Constitution is what I call Republic Review. It is pulling the Republic together and reviewing that document and ensuring that what's being performed and what's being done is within the purview of that document, period. I think it's a logical marketing concept, Republic Review. Again, it is not a constitutional convention. It is not a convention of states. These two terms, convention of states and or a constitutional convention, requires an Article 5 application of the states to Congress. The states don't need to apply when they want to enforce their contract. All they need to do is say, you know what, we're done. You're, you're running us into the ditch on, on debt. You're doing all of these tyrannical things to us. You're taking our property. We're done. We're going to audit you. Prove to me today that you actually have the authority from our state 
to exercise the Department of Interior to have any BLMs, ATFs, and all of these things, FBI, all of these things are outside the purview of the Constitution. So guess who's public enemy number one? The guy that's saying this. But if you all start focusing and join me in getting this out and becoming a part of the constitutional warrior that I'm hoping to make out of everybody, then when I get killed, because, you know, they, believe me, if they find me cut up in the freezer, don't believe the suicide note, okay? <laughs> so, Republic Review is not any of these two types of conventions, just to, just to make clear, because a lot of people, they see that C word, convention, and they go, oh, I don't know, that's bad. What is the definition of a convention? Does anybody know? It's a process. In engineering, there are conventions, there are processes of manufacturing, there's processes. That's what convention really means. Anyway, in conclusion, all of these slides, like I said at the very beginning, these are going to be available, as well as these videos and so forth. So this is round one of what we have to do. The second presentation, and both of these presentations I've never given to anybody, so this is all kind of new material, so forgive me if I've stumbled or you know, if I've sprayed on you for getting too excited. But anyway, um, are there any questions? Do we want to have microphones? Okay. And while you ask questions, I'm going to prep up the next set of slides so we can do this efficiently. Okay. Well, my question has to do with federal lands okay. that are within the boundaries of the states. Isn't there some, let me see how to phrase this. It, my understanding is that, like for example, Idaho, because Idaho entered the union at a later date, the federal government still has jurisdiction over 70% of the land within the border of Idaho. Is that accurate or would that be inaccurate? Okay, so what you're saying is accurate because the federal government assumes, you know what happens when anybody assumes, but the federal government assumes that they still have the authority over actual sovereign state's property. Show me in the Constitution where they can retain any authority. As a matter of fact, it's in Article 1, Section 8, I think it's subsection 17, that dictates what the federal government can possess land for. And none of it is having to do with departments of forestry, uh, EPA, whatever you want to do. It's literally for very limited scope things. For the seat of government, Washington, D.C., and it says it can only be 10 nautical miles by 10 nautical miles. Virginia took their part back, by the way. Um, but they can have forts, they can have military training, they can have posts, uh, like post offices. Those are the necessary and proper things that they need, but for them to possess forest of a sovereign state is unconstitutional. And the basis that they started making these things, these are all regulations and statutes, once again, that they've gone outside the scope of the Constitution, and they didn't go back to the states and say, hey, can, can we do this? No, they assumed their, uh, the, their supremacy over these things. And they used John Marshall's precedences and they built off of those unconstitutional footings to do all of that. Next question. Uh, there is a, um, there's a movement to amend the Constitution to overturn the Citizens United uh, case, Supreme Court case. So why is an amendment required for that? But was there an amendment uh, that overturned Dred Scott? No. No, and as a matter of fact, um, that's a completely different presentation, if you don't mind, as far as okay, the conventions yeah. and amendments and those types of things, because I would pr probably stand here for a while and talk about some of the things that are going on, my position on the Article 5 convention process and so forth. And I, so, but no, there's been no overturning. And as a matter of fact, just real quick in summary, my position on any constitutional convention or Article 5 process, it's a waste of time. It does not solve the non-compliance. We don't, Madison didn't try to assume a new convention to amend it when they created the Sedition Act. What did he do? He, he basically said these are all violations. He went to the other states and we go, we hope you agree with this, but they didn't. And so what he ended up having to do was their only last bag that they had was called nullification. And they said, we will nullify these laws and we will not enforce them. 
That was the last, you know, act that they could do because the other states would not support the Constitution as they were duty bound to do because and we'll get into this in this, these, everybody takes an oath. If you're a political officer, and there are other offices that require oaths. And so anyway, question over here and then over here, down here. Do, you know, any, do you know anything about the history of executive orders? How they yeah, I, I can tell you that Washington's first executive order, I was probably gonna cover this tonight, or maybe not. If you read his first executive order, it is the recognition for this nation of thanksgiving. And it has nothing to do with pilgrims and Indians and people starving. It had everything to do with recognizing the divine hand of providence in granting them this constitution. So go read that first executive order. But I, in my first book, I do talk about how the president has, has strayed the presidency is straight in using their power in legislating because executive orders are strictly, and Washington did this, as military orders. He gets a law, here comes the law from Congress, okay, and his executive order is the directions of how they're going to enforce this law or enact it. That's all an executive order is supposed to be. But it has grown into acts of legislation. Yes, sir. Yeah, first of all, thank you for coming out and making this presentation. This is great information. Um, I'm going to take a devil's advocate question here for you, okay? Okay, just I'm remember very, who you're going to be, though. I'm a, I'm, a <laughs> I'm a very practical person, and my observation is that the Constitution is widely disregarded already. Yeah. And this seems somewhat academic compared to present-day reality, sure. boots-on-the-ground reality. Okay. So my question would be, how do you get to, you know, from... Um, from where we are today, widely disregarded, you know, nobody cares anymore, it seems, sadly, uh -huh. sadly, right. to yeah. what you're talking about. And is there an interim step or a series of interim steps that have to happen before we can even get to that point where people start waking up and they start actually doing something and following the Constitution for a change? There you go right there. I will be answering that question in more detail than you probably care. If you ate something, I hope I don't give you indigestion. Question, sir. The mic's coming. Okay, here's the mic. Um, I don't think that Washington State would be the state to say, oh, we're going to be the first ones to go against this. And we're from Idaho, and I don't even think Idaho would be it because we're sort of overwhelmed by Boise. What would be the best state to focus on? And if they said, we're going to do it, would I Other right states here. go along with them? Do they have sure. to? Sure, sure. Go ahead. My only question is, I think you're brilliant and I'm loving this and I'm ready to hear the next part. Can you start? <laughs> <laughs> I'm humbled. I, I have no idea why, um, why my hard studies and so forth it really came to the fruition of finding these things. People, I have yet to have a presentation where somebody doesn't come up or make a comment, post comment to an email or something. Why hasn't anybody ever thought of this? I don't know. I, I, if you read my bio, I had classical training in intelligence. I was in the eminent community for a long time. I had 35 years in the intelligence community as an analyst and so forth. And so uh, that classical training has always tried to get me to look at the big picture. Well, what's the big picture? And the big picture was <laughs> they're not following the Constitution. I know all of these things. And then I started putting it together. They called it a contract. So in looking at all the facts, I was able to quickly, again, I don't know why anybody didn't think that we, we had these powers. Madison basically just didn't write it out. Please audit the Constitution when they get too far off track. Because he knew they would. He actually thought that the Constitution was going to die 50 years you know, after 1830, because in 1830 he was uh, talking at the Virginia um, State Constitutional Convention, and he basically made the, a public comment that he goes, he doesn't see this Constitution going another 50 years, because as the state started growing, the interest of the hinterland and the inside or interior of the states were going to be completely different than the west or the east coast. And he said, as this thing grows, he didn't think this Constitution was going to match that. And again, I really don't think Madison, you know, recognized the divine hand of providence of what they really gave us. Uh, he thought that 
it was just more of a mechanical thing. Uh, if you understand Madison, he really was very conscientious in trying not to, you know, create associations between religion. And as a matter of fact, if you understand what what Madison was doing with his executive orders of giving fast and prayer for specific issues to the nation, he rescinded half of those requests of prayer going out. In other words, he asked the nation to pray as they were preparing for something, and then he felt, oh, you know what, I think I might be overstepping my bounds, and he rescinded some of those. And so it, he was very conscientious of trying not to step on people's religious expressions and trying to tell, dictate to them what they had to do. So anyway, I, I probably digressed a little bit in giving you some history, but it is Obama's fault. I'll just let you know that. Anyway, any yeah. other questions or without? Yes. Okay. Uh, when an audit is conducted, you know, there are findings and uh, uh, recommendations that are made for you know, correction of sure. corrective action. Yep. Um, you've talked about the audit review. What do you see as the steps following that? I assume that if this was a management audit. So that's my third book, and I've okay. written it, but I haven't published it yet. Okay. So you're going to keep us in suspense? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I just don't want to present that type of stuff now. Okay. What I, the Constitution actually has all of this. The Constitution has the forces of what the states have, and to be able to, you know, implement, you know, their authority once again. And, but I'll get into that again when, I'm, when we're there. What I want to do is just get this out, this concept of being able to audit and stepping forward into um, taking the authority of the states and or the authority of the Constitution by the states back again and becoming a true constitutional republic. Okay? All right. Well, uh, one more question. I, yes, sir. Well, one problem I like to suggest is uh, some counties have sheriffs that have gone back to federal uh, training on what the Constitution means, and they might not like what's being said and might want to want to stop it. Oh, I can guarantee you that if um, my wife is very, very concerned, I go by GR. There's a reason for that, and. Um, it's not just those people. I'm really not too concerned about those people. I'm really more concerned about the people that will recognize that their billion dollar, trillion dollar industry, banking and so forth, will be truly impacted and affected. That we are actually going to take this country back by doing this. And they will lose their control over this country. If you, if you garner that, you know, as long as this message moves forward and it doesn't silence tonight, and it continues if everybody else tells an audience of 50 people and keeps going because the whole point of creating these slides, I'll take this break right now and saying this, the whole point of creating these slides and what I'm going to do next is kind of create the script so that people can get up and present these, go to another county, so I can't be everywhere. This is going to spread like wildfire if this starts moving. I I can only be in so many places, so what I have to do is create constitutional warriors, and I need 100 in every state to be able to work in different counties and to be able to put the appropriate pressure where, it's a, where it needs to be applied at that given point in time. And so, I, I truly am aware of what the threats are, and <laughs> my wife has pointed this out to me. And so, I, uh, I'm not too concerned with people that are teaching federalism. I mean, they're a little closer at least, right? They're a little closer than the, the progressives of democracy and that we can do anything that we want to as long as we get the right votes and have a mob rule. So let me move forward. So what powers does the Constitution grant to the states? That's, that's a live, anybody know what the answer of that is? All powers not delegated to the federal government are granted inherently to the states. Okay, so when people want to know, well, they don't have this power. Absolutely, we have this power. Is it in the Constitution? Did, what's that? Well, so that's kind of an implication, but the, the power of auditing the Constitution, who has the power? If it's not in the Constitution, that means that the states have that power. Yes, sir. You got to turn yourself on. You, you say granted. The Constitution doesn't grant powers to the states. The states 
set those powers. No, I understand that. Okay. I understand Granted that. Like but the, but most granted. people understand that the Constitution does grant powers to the federal government. They're delegated powers. So I get these constitutional organizations. Well, where is that granted? You know that the states can do that, and I have to answer that question with well, so what powers are granted to the states in the Constitution? Zero. Those are, this, those are the powers, as a matter of fact, Nicholson said this, I, I, I give you a little story. Right after Madison spoke, uh, June 8th, 1788, Nichols got up in f supporting the Federalists and he basically put it like this. If I had a thousand acres and I delegated and gave and granted and bequeathed Mr. Christina a portion of those, do I have to re-survey my property to basically give myself a new deed? No. I still possess the property that I keep. I still possess the powers, responsibilities, and roles that I have not given up to Mr. Christina. And it's the same application. And I think Nichols really articulated well in the Virginia ratification debates. Okay, so if we can get one state, this is what we got to do. We just need to get one state to start the initiatory process because then it gets out of GR's hands. It gets out of me being able to go out and give this message because now we've got a state that becomes the beacon. Does this make sense? And so this state's going to call upon all. So here's the trillion dollar question. How do we get there from here? I'm going to tell you. What's that? Go to Oklahoma. Go to Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, so... Here's, here's the big secret. State legislatures possess the power. When the ch Constitution needs to be changed, and as a matter of fact, Madison and Jefferson talk about this in the Kentucky, Virginia, and in the Virginia's follow-on in 1880s, or 18, I always say 1880, 1800 resolution, Madison clearly states that the states and the legislative bodies are duty-bound and obligated to step in. So if you go and read these resolutions, what Madison and Jefferson are saying is so powerful, it's just amazing. But the state legislatures are the guys, the guys that were in here, these three guys that stood up here. They're the ones that are supposed to be doing this. So it is their job to ensure compliance and it's obviously something that they've not been doing and that they've been as well asleep. So what is it our job? to wake them up. We've got to wake them up and we've got to call them out. And I'll get to how and why. So how can we convince state legislatures to do their job in protecting us from federal tyranny? Well, as I've just quickly educated you on the Constitution, the whole fact of it's a, it's a, it's a contract, that we're the stakeholders, and that we have these powers, we have to educate them that they possess this power. They don't even know they have this power because the education system didn't tell them. It's been very nefarious in how they have taught our constitutional powers and roles that the federal government is powerful in all things. And everybody believes this. I'm telling you, the Constitution and the framers say absolutely differently. And so once we convince them to take the initiative, then the ball starts rolling on the floor of that state assembly, right? because now they're going to be getting involved. And so we have two methods of motivation, right? Everybody understands the stick and the carrot, right? Okay, there's our motives. How are we going to use those? Well, before I get into that, I need to basically point out that there is one battlefield. And that primarily is here in the states. It's not in D.C. The most important battlefield for us in this room is this county. People to the north, it's in that county. And Olympia. It, we need to take this battlefield from our counties to Olympia and demand that they do their job. So we need two approaches to do this. And these happen simultaneously. And sometimes they can happen, so they can first start with a coalition. And as a matter of fact, I'm hoping that maybe these states that I'll talk about later, a coalition in Washington, Olympia, Washington, they actually start talking to some of these other legislatures in other states going, you know, you guys could be doing this. And that's how it gets rolling. So just like the Revolutionary War, these 
leaders actually acted upon themselves. They didn't have this big election. They didn't have to educate the electorate and say, you know, do we think we want to revolt. What do you guys think about this? They were a republic at the time, and they were the representatives of the people, and because they were, they were empowered to make those decisions. That's one of the reasons why we actually had a revolutionary war, because they led and acted. Had they waited and said, well, we got to do a poll and survey, like typical politics, we'd probably still be a part of the crown in the commonwealth, right? So we don't have the time right now to really go into um, going through the election process, or I should say the educational process for everybody, and I'll get into this as far as educating, because people will get educated on this. But they didn't have the time at that time, and we don't have the time, and we have people that are empowered just like them. So the, there's no difference between what they did for the Revolutionary War and what we can do and what we need to do now. So again, educating all the leaders, and this is literally, when I say all the leaders, I mean the state party leaders. Guess what? There's a Constitution Party, and the Constitution Party chair lives in this area, and he actually supports my executive summary. Hopefully I get with him that he can take this at the party level to the national level. We need Susan Hutchinson of the Republican Party to take the time to read this. I know it takes an hour or so to read my executive summary and all the citations, but take the time to read this and get her on board and get all the party leadership as well as our politicians. And so what we have to do is get them, the politicians, to start building this coalition and network of those who are willing to support the Constitution. Motivating and uniting these leaders to me is very easy. Again, the stick and carrot thing. These leaders are serving for a reason. They have political motives, and some of these are noble and some of them aren't. But the point is that we want them to sign a petition. We want every, I want every elected official, and so far the elected officials that I talk to, such as Ed Pace, Rob, Rob, I, he hasn't read it yet, but uh, those who have read it actually are on board and they want to sign the petition. So I ha I'm batting a thousand right now. I haven't found a politician that has come up with this lame excuse that they won't do it. But it's not just signing the petition. I need them to be advocates. They need to go to other legislatures, both within the state and outside the state. They need to become the salesmen and leaders, just like Madison and Hamilton. Those guys just didn't stay within the boundaries of their colony and state. They went well beyond that. So what we're going to do is get all these petitions pointing from the local level and even within the state and the state legislatures to go to all of the state legislatures and point out to them their constitutional responsibility and getting them that they, telling them that they have the power. So I've provided, I think, the documentation, the presentation. It's just a matter of just getting these people the, the facts and the information, and I truly believe that they're going to sign it if they are loyal to the Constitution. So what they have to do at this coalition level is basically go back to the states and say, if you do not have a, what this says up here, this Constitutional Committee of Correspondence, I'm basically doing the exact same thing they did in 1772 when Britain came in and basically took over all of the legislative bodies, the leaders that were in the legislative bodies created a committee of correspondence. Does anybody know about these committees of correspondence? Great. That was a shadow government. And that was a shadow government that was protecting individual liberty and sovereignty and demanding their rights as British citizens. Unlike the shadow government that we hear about today that is trying to actually throw us into subjugation and get rid of the Constitution. I'm telling you, the peril is so great that we don't have time. We need to really focus and concentrate our efforts on this. I know that there's other things that may be really important, but there's nothing greater than saving our Constitution Republic. So once we convince some of these reluctant guys and the way to do this, I actually I mean, because I haven't convinced them yet, but some of these reluctant guys will, are gals, Congress people in Congress, anybody that is a Republican or somebody that says they're loyal, we can actually start using these honors and privileges that they have as a leader. They've stepped into the fray of leadership. And so if they're truly honest, 
And if they truly mean that they're loyal to the Constitution, they're a humble servant, then they should, you know, quickly sign once they've given. Remember that premise, reasonable people equally informed seldom disagree? These people shouldn't disagree too much, as long as they're being reasonable, and as long as they understand what they should be doing. So the coalition needs to start communicating with the CCC, which is that Constitutional Committee of Correspondence. And as the legislature start working down with the counties going, we need more petitions. We need petitions out of these counties, such as King County, Pierce, and so forth. Um, yeah. So they're going to start enlisting the support of the counties. And as a matter of fact, these committees, I'll get into the details of these, but these committees are going to be motivating the local politicians and the local leadership at the county level. And so the county level, the grassroots effort, now that we're getting into that, they're going to manage these petitions for the city council, commissioners, and so forth, and I'll go through that. But here are the likely organizations that should be just eating this up. They should be eating Republic Review and saving the Constitution up. The Republicans, the Libertarians, and the Constitutional Party. They all agree that the Constitution's a contract and it is being violated severely. That's why here in this county, I've gotten all three chairs to basically agree that we need to do something and start standing for the Constitution again. So there are other organizations within the county, such as militias, Oath Keepers and those types of things, those people will support this as well. So it's just getting the word out to organizations that I will call friendly to this concept. Getting those leaders to signing petitions. So we're starting to accumulate petitions from both elected officials and actual leadership within the county group. And so once these things start going through, they're going to manage these and they'll be forwarding those out. We must motivate group leaders, though, to unify, and that's one of the things I want to do with Spokane County, is get these party chairs not to abandon their, their responsibilities over their parties, but to basically start unifying that we're going to put the Constitution first, to make sure that our candidates, are the, 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 the person that we're going to support and elect is the most constitutional candidate. Right now in Spokane County, it's all Republicans. There's no competition between Libertarians, I think, in this race that I know of, and there's no competition with the Constitutional Party. And I've gotten both of those other parties to support the Republicans. In other words, they're going to endorse the Republicans because they're the most conservative, maybe not the most constitutional. But as we start moving this, we're going to start finding and bringing up and hopefully grooming better candidates that will actually lead in support of the Constitution. So each, can or each county will be required to unify organizations so that they can start leveraging more. You know that old saying, divided we stand, or I should say, united we stand, divided we fall. That's a, that's a correct adage. And the reason we've been losing elections in this county and in other counties is because we've been divided. The Libertarians, Constitutional, all these little factions over little things. It gives, goes back to that fountain of power. If we unify that onto one thing, and that's the Constitution, and focus that, that all of our elected officials will support that, sign these petitions, and demand that our state steps up and does its job, then our problems are going to go away. It's that simple. So the CCC's focus is supposed to work with these political officials and getting them to sign, getting other leaders to sign. They're also going to have um, an established constitutional test and standards. They're going to get into um, the dissemination of these petitions. As a matter of fact, I, I talk about this in the next slide, but um, there needs to be some cross-pollinating and sharing of information and scripts and so forth. I, uh, I may be a decent author, I don't know, but I know that there, there can be improvements made and I'm always for, you know, constant improvement. And so I truly believe that whatever I come up with in a petition may be good, but you, you, everybody can contribute and make these things better. The scripts and so forth, these committees are going to own these. I'm not saying that we have to have a single petition or a single script for the counties in working with their political officials. And this is going to be a document that a, that a political official is going to sign. It's a petition that basically says, I recognize I'm living under federal tyranny and I demand my state legislate, something like that. Anyway, so I'm not saying that I'm the ultimate author of this and actually I'm, I'm really not the leader in this. I'm just the guy with the idea. You already have leaders. Either your party chairs or organizations. I'm just a guy with a radio show and, and, and the thought. 
that what we need to do, if, if this makes sense. But what we, these guys also have to do is they have to track voting records, hold their feet accountable. They're going to provide content, and here's the cross-pollination, right? So these CCCs in each county are going to start working with each other and improving their processes, because who knows? Out there in Ponderay, they actually may have a better petition that's just ironclad, right? And why can't we adopt that? It's not, you have to, it does not have to be um, written and had s signed and approved by one particular person. As a matter of fact, I've always said that, you know, somebody else's eyes will, you know, like a child's eyes can come up and solve a problem. I just think that we got to get past the, um, the language and, and sometimes we just sweat over that. I've worked with perfectionists and I think I put it up on one of the slides. Better is the enemy of good enough. And so just get your petitions, get your scripts and start moving forward. There's going to be a financial structure that needs to be supported. We're going to need to find some people willing to either contribute their time, resources, money, or what have you to basically going around getting petition signed. We're going to have to have actual rubber to the road, getting somebody to sign a piece of paper. I don't want to do this e-signature because that could get corrupted. We could lose that. A physical paper, it could be burnt, but we have, if we have physical security, I think we'll be fine. But bottom line, there is some finances that I think have to be addressed, so I wanted to make sure this is here, and I would recommend this be a 501c3 type of thing. Um, always nonprofit is always better because when people contribute, then they get the tax write-off. Here's the thing, though. Washington did not fight the revolution based on non-taxable contributions, right? They didn't have that then. And so, you know, this really requires loyal patriots. And that's what this CCC needs to identify. Who are the loyal patriot businesses and other people that can, philanthropists, anybody that's out there that loves the Constitution, wants to save it, this is the cause to get involved in. So the operations, again, the, the CCC is going to be conducting meetings. They're going to be setting up meetings with leaders to get them to sign petitions. If they need the materials, if they need a presentation, they'll send somebody out to give these presentations and basically go through, this is how we're going to do it. This is what you need to do. This is how we do it. So the objective, again, I'm going to repeat this, and they say in cells, if you repeat something seven times, it actually sinks in. And so the objective is to get all political of, um, appointed or elected people that have to raise their arm to the square to sign a petition to demand their state legislatures audit the Constitution, right? We want them to actually step in and stop the federal tyranny. That's what we've got to do. If not, we're going to lose it all, folks. So in getting these objectives, um, in presenting this executive summary like I'm doing, in reading the executive summary, this is the stuff that you've got. And you can do this better than me, probably. I'm not the best. I'm shaking in my boots up here. I'm always fearful in talking in front of a bunch of people. Um, well, at least I dry up in my mouth. Anyway, um, what we need to do is um, basically start getting this out. And I think this bottom bullet really says it all. I think we've been living in a third awakening that started in the 90s with the first ramping up of Hillary Care. And I think that there has been an awakening within America where uh, churches are starting to step up and do their job and patriots and the Patriot Party and so forth, the Tea Party. I am telling you that now is the time, the awakening has already begun and what we need to do is get these people the information of Republic Review because I believe that that's what they're thirsting and Republic Review is the nectar. And I'm not just saying that because I wrote this. I'm just saying that because nobody's been able to refute the, constitu or refute the constitutionality of Republic Review, that the states do have this power. Here's the carrot method. So I told you about the carrot method. I mentioned it a few times. There is a privilege and an honor to be renowned for reclaiming the republic, for unleashing economic opportunities, right? For expanding wealth, for enabling their constituents. All of these things will happen if we get federal tyranny out of our lives. Now, it doesn't mean Washington, Olympia, won't be tyrannical, but bottom line, this, the Constitution doesn't protect us from state governments. 
That's on us, and we're, we have to fix that through our process, but we can fix the federal problem very quickly. And so here's what I think are motivating factors for elected officials and state legislatures. They can become true leaders. I'll digress with a little story. Madison was the guy that wrote the Virginia plan, and I can go into the real details of this, but bottom line, when his plan was read by Governor Randolph at the Constitutional Convention, it was rejected. A real leader doesn't take personal offense, and they don't personalize. What, uh, what I see in most people is they personalize stuff, and they go, well, if you're, I'm going to take my ball and go home. That's the common thing. Madison had such integrity that as they went through the New Jersey plan, and then when Sherman presented the Connecticut Compromise of creating the bicameral Congress and, and recognizing state sovereignties and so forth, that's what they went with, and guess what? That's what Nad Madison supported. He supported the whole thing. If you read his notes on the Constitutional Convention, you will find that he actually exposes some of his feelings. Like, he didn't like certain things, and he wrote that down. And so it's kind of interesting to see what he didn't like, but he still supported it. Right? I mean, that guy had true integrity to say, well, this is what we elected, this is what we got, this is, this is the pig we dressed, and that's what we're going to the prom with, right? Anyway, it wasn't that bad. But anyway, this also does the last thing here. This, by them saving us from federal tyranny, means that they're compliant with their oath of office. The stick method, any guesses? Get them out of office. I say if they don't want to sign the petition, let them defend that position in the next election. And let the voters tear them apart. We may have to go with an unsavory, but if the CCC is doing their job, they'll already have a groomed constitutional candidate that is worthy of going forward and raising their arm to the square and replacing that person. They have to live up to their oaths, folks. So eventually we will want all candidates. As far as I'm concerned, I've been floating this idea and I've been seeing this more and more and I, it was in my first book in 2013. We want all candidates to be able to pass a constitutional test, right? I mean, you have to pass a test to drive on the, on the road, right? And, you know, so we, the state can trust you that you won't hurt yourself or anybody else. Well, I'm telling you, political officials and politicians can hurt more people than a single driver or somebody firing a weapon. As a matter of fact, CAFE standards have killed thousands and thousands of people of what they've done to cars. Getting rid of DDT killed millions of people around the world and there's no founded evidence that DDT was as bad as anybody said it was. I'm telling you, politicians can kill and have more harm and do more harm to us in our society than anybody else. And so having a constitutional test, I think, is paramount. You got to know if your bill you're signing is going to be a violation of the Constitution or not. If you don't know the Constitution, then how do you know? Anyway, I'm sorry. So our local targets and the politicians that we want to focus on, the sheriff, county commissioners, city council, blah, blah, blah. And as a matter of fact, there are a whole bunch of other obscure elected officials, utility right? School board. There's all of these people that are elected, and guess what? They have to do this. I affirm or swear that I will support the Constitution. And as a matter of fact, I get into that. Um, so lo don't, don't let me jump ahead. It should be an equal honor for anybody that is a politician to be able to support the Constitution as well as taking our money in, you know, regulating and doing all of these other things as an elected official. I think that it's an, it is actually a greater honor to do the greater thing for the best of society in protecting individual liberty and sovereignty than any regulation a politician could say, I gave you this bill. We did these things to protect you. The greatest protection they can give us is to save that document. <clears throat> So the document in the battlefield, <laughs> thank you, sir, um, what you need to do is you need to create in the states, in the CCCs, I should say, in the counties, you need to create a document for the battlefield. And what that can be is it can be a map. 
It could be a big, huge virtual document, but what you want to do is start putting faces, get their picture, their name, and their position, title, and whether they've signed the Constitution. This document is going to identify friend and foe. So that way, everybody that takes their arm to the square will be documented on this map, and we'll start working on them. And the, the way, we're going to work on them two ways. We'll either try to motivate them with a carrot, or we'll use the stick and start grooming somebody to replace them. And, you know, in some of these small little bastions of maybe progressive areas, we may have a little problem, but the parties have other mechanisms, and I'll be working with them in getting people in there. But I truly believe that when it comes down to this one thing, the Constitution, most people, most red-blooded Americans will say, yeah, that Constitution is more important. And I believe we're going to find that some of these political officials and leaders on the progressive side will say, actually, the Constitution's archaic, we don't need it. And I want them to defend those comments in the next election. Don't you? So we have to demand our leaders protect us again. I've said this the seventh time probably. We need to be protected from federal tyranny. And what this process is in this election and vetting and getting constitutional candidates in is separating the wheat from the chaff. It's a slow process, but we can do it. So why are we targeting these elected officials instead of citizens? If this doesn't make sense, then hopefully this, what I said earlier, might ring a bell. We're a republic, and these are our representatives. We have empowered them to do things. They represent, I don't, how many people in this county, in, in Spokane County? How much? About 350,000. So the county commissioners represent 350,000. The sheriff represents 350, 500,000. Okay, I, I stand literally corrected. And so these people actually, when they write a petition to the state legislatures, it's not coming from Rob Chase. It's coming from a representative of 500,000 people. And they can put this in their petition that as the representative of the county of Spokane, I am demanding that you do your job in protecting us. Does that make sense? So that's why citizens, I'm just one person. We're just one person. We'd have to flood them with millions and millions of petitions to equate what some of these other representatives already represent. So that's why if the Revolutionary War, they used the representatives, and the representatives were just leaders. They just did the right thing. I'm just trying to echo that exact same direction. So if we haven't noticed, the current process has failed. Electing people, counting on the courts to protect us from federal tyranny and so forth, it's been failing. This is why we really have to do this. And so we need to get our elected officials to represent us and protecting that Constitution. So here it is. This is the oath. What's that first line? I will support the Constitution. If you're doing anything, you're violating your oath if you're doing anything that does not support the Constitution. The Hearst decision does not support the Constitution. Doing business with unconstitutional government does not support the Constitution. Does that make sense? Everybody in Olympia that is signing on with anything EPA, energy, anything that is unconstitutional, they're violating their oath. That's why the framers were brilliant in demanding that oaths of office in supporting this Constitution separates them. I mean, it's in the Constitution. Yes, it is. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Uh, we, I, 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 I can't articulate the word for word. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yes. So the gentleman is saying that the, our representatives are not only violating the U.S. Constitution, but they're also violating the state. And every state actually uh, tags in that their own Constitution, that they support it as well as the U.S. Constitution. But come on, folks. It's listed first. Right? Come on. Do your job. Actually, if you could hold on to your questions, I'm getting close to the end. I... Uh, City of Spokane Valley, cha we changed uh, our oath of office, so it now reads, I will support and defend the Constitution of both the United States and the state of Washington. Yeah, because the minimum standard is that you have to at least support it. And defending it is that step beyond. In other words, you're going to gird up your loins and go to war, right? 
You're get, in supporting, you're supposed to do your job and not do anything that would be a detriment to it. But defending it means you're actually going out and becoming the advocate for it. So it does matter. And as a matter of fact, to get somebody to read my executive summary, like I said before, it may, if you read some of these founding documents, it'd probably take you 20 minutes. I think that if you're a novice and it's the first time you read my executive summary, I've heard some people take maybe two hours. Look at the opportunity cost of what that two hours can do for you. It will, if you understand the Constitution somewhat, it'll broaden your paradigm. If you believe the progressive paradigm, it will totally shift your paradigm to understanding that the states and their role and responsibility within this Constitution. And so I, you know, I have a hard time understanding why somebody just can't take the time. I know we're all busy. But we're all here because of one reason, because we love the Constitution. That's why I have a lot of hope and faith that everybody in this room becomes constitutional warriors. If you understand what Aristotle said in politics, the two reasons for revolution are you're not feeding your people. In other words, if the people are starving, look at the, the Arab Spring. Because they were starving, they revolted. That is the driving factor behind most, if the French Revolution was, they were starving. It's just that the communist movement failed. Anyway, because the, it came from the communes and the communist movement was actually seated there, but I, I, I don't want to digress too much. But what Aristotle said was the other reason for a revolution was when the people realized that the politicians are getting rich off of their hard work, off of their backs. And that's when people just say, eh, enough with this. And it's not just our politicians that are doing this in violating our Constitution. It is globalists and so forth. And that's why I say when the message starts getting out, you know, I don't want to be the only public enemy, number one. I want to share that with you. I mean, I want you guys to be a part of this. I really do. It's not about GR having his name in lights or his name on a tombstone. It's about, you know, doing the right thing, right? Managers do things right because there's a process and that's what they're supposed to do. A leader does the right thing. If somebody's gonna die because of the process, then the leader will step in and stop. We're not gonna do that because that person's gonna die. That's what a leader does. And I'm just trying to be a leader and I want you to be leaders as well. So, we're going to educate everybody, but we can't educate the electorate. We don't have the time to do this. As a matter of fact, um, if you look at the Moses analogy, I like telling people, how long did it take Moses to educate Israel and to change their culture? It took 40 years. 40 years before they could go in the promised land. And he had unattested access to them. He performed miracles. They fed, man they fed off of manna, right? The Lord fed them in the desert. They were saved by looking at a staff. They had all of these different miracles and it still took 40 years. We don't have that time, right? We have to change the paradigms of leaders and get leaders to act and recognize that now's the time to do it. And that's one of the reasons why I believe in cancer education. That what will happen is people will start seeing these leaders saying, we've got to do this. We're going to dismantle all this Leviathan and unco- What well, can we live without those things? Well, they're going to get cancer education. What does cancer education mean? When you know somebody's got cancer in your family, the first time your life has been touched by that, what's the first thing you do? My father had non-Hopkins lymphoma. I went and read on that. I got smart on that and tried to help my dad in fighting that. That's what I call cancer education. So when people start realizing that they're doing something to save the constant, well, let me get, if they really care, they're going to get educated. If not, then there are other educational programs that we literally need to get in. And I'm working actually with um, a certified educational um, system that's actually coast to coast. And they're expanding it to including this new paradigm of states' authority and powers to audit. And so anyway, we'll have an education program later once this convention really starts moving and enforces. And my third book gets published. So anyway. That's one of the reasons why it's not that I don't care about the people. We don't have the time, right? So what we have to do, again, and I've already covered this, we have to formulate ironclad 
petitions and ironclad scripts so that we can do robotic type of presentations. If you've ever been to a Bose uh, presentation, they're very robotic. They say the exact same words if you're in one store to another and so forth using their marketing terms and everything else. It's the same thing. As long as we don't stray from the content and stray from the heart of the message, anybody can get up here and give this. As, whether you're reading a script and just pointing through the slides, I don't have to be the one. That's my point. I don't have to be the one. And that's why I want you to get my slides and share them with people. Get my executive summary and share them with people. Again, the status quo has been failing us, and I, I can't repeat that enough. We have to get a CCC formed, and we need to get, um, there, we need to support them. We need to support the um, Republican, Libertarian, and Constitutional parties in, you know, uniting and vetting constitutional candidates and ensuring that the people that are going to be elected that are coming up from the ranks, whether they be PCOs or they just be Joe on the street, that under, they have to understand the Constitution and they have to be the ones that have become advocates and defending it, okay? So what we need to do again is we need to start reaching out to adjacent states, states and I've already talked about this and here they are. We're really close to the end folks. This is the good. These are the good states. There's 34 good states and if you can't read this you will in the, when you get the soft copy of this. But these blue states, if you look right here to the right, that's a ratio. In other words, in Wyoming they almost have six Republicans to one Democrat. And that's almost the same in Utah. They have five Republicans to one Democrat. Down to the bottom of the blue in Virginia, it's two to one. Two to one. So these states are the most likely candidates that actually you know, should be able to receive this and go, you know what, I do represent the con a constitutional founded party, hopefully, and if not, they can be rooted out really quick. Right? And again, Here's Washington in the gold. It's not that they deserve any gold, but that's how close Washington is to flipping to become a green. Right down here. Yeah, let me get the pointer here. There's Washington right there. New Mexico is the 34th state. So actually they have 34 states that have Republican control, a trifecta actually. Both houses and the governor. So here's the priority. Wyoming Utah, does this help? I think this answers your question. Somebody was asking, where do we want to start? There you go. Those are the states. If you know people in those states, anybody that has affluence in those states, get your people educated. And I'll be happy to fly out there. I'll be happy to talk and so forth. I'm cheap. I, I am. Um, second priority, third and fourth priority. So we have to start socializing. I love that word, right? We want to socialize this idea in a good way. So we have to get started with the CCC locally. We've got to get this model going so that we can actually start duplicating this model in every county in the Republic. As this idea goes forward, it will be like a fire on the landscape, landscape with the wind, with the prevailing wind just blowing it from one, one coast to the next. Does that make sense? I think so. <clears throat> I'm getting a little more drier here. I want to re-edify you on this whole point of knowledge and power and this whole focusing. As you start to understand these principles, and it's really simple, I don't have to make this very complicated, we have the power at the state level. The states can take this back. And if you understand that, and that becomes the knowledge factor for you, then let's start focusing our fountain of power with our representatives and get them to make it about the Constitution. And that's where the reason our representatives and leadership are all over the map because we keep on putting them there. It's about abortion. It's about immigration. It's about refugees. No, it's about the Constitution. Have I said that enough? I apologize. So if we start using the Constitution as our weapon and our shield, both in the political fray and in the public fray, we're going to win battles. We'll win every single one because every red-blooded American loves their freedom of expression. They love their freedom of speech. They love their immunities from illegal search and seizure, those types of things. As a matter of fact, even the liberals have tried to chant this. Now they want to take them away from you. They're this close and they're actually surfacing these ideologies and it's becoming a part of their mantra. Free school for everybody at your expense. We know that that's not constitutional. So. 
again, these slides are available for everybody. And so I'll put these up. If you follow me on Facebook, I will basically announce when I've got these things converted to PDF and actually up on my website. I have two domains. It's reclaimingtherepublic.org and MobyStrip Press. Any questions? I, I, I put everybody to sleep. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rob. I turned the heat up. Okay, this is more of a comment than a question. But um, along these lines, uh, Sunday night we're having a level one center for self-governance, Keep the Republic, and that's the Valley Library. And it's uh, the best money I ever spent is $50, but there's five levels. And several of you have been to this, so it's level one. And then level two uh, is at, if you've already taken level one, is at the Otis Orchards Library Monday night. So Mark Herr will be here uh, Sunday and Monday night. So try to get signed up for it. If you've already taken it, it's just $10 to audit again. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. No, thank you. I've, I've got a mic. Oh, okay. Sorry. He's got it. <clears throat> Anybody else? Questions? Questions? And just to piggyback on what Rob said, uh, what GR is saying here ties in very, very closely with what uh, the Center for Self-Governance is trying to teach. So I think it's a, a very symbiotic uh, relationship yep. between the two of them. So thank you, GR. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Madison uh, dreaded the electorate, but he knew that he could not create an aristocracy or allow one to be formed with the new government. And so um, they really tried, and he made that public knowledge. He actually said in the Federalist Papers that the, uh, this nation was a nation of illiterates. And we're even more illiterate about the Constitution today than they were back then. So he wanted, and they ended up creating what I believe was a government of self-governance that was protecting us from ourselves by distributing sovereignty to these different levels. But anyway. There's the uh, websites up there on the screen. Yeah, and that's a Mobius Strip Press right there. All right, that's a Mobius Strip, I should say. And as a matter of fact, I'll do this, I usually do this one time where I'm in a forum like this. I don't do this very often, but if anybody can tell me what all five of these documents are, I'll give you 20 bucks. Okay, the fifth one. I'm sorry, who what? Nope, nope. Nope. Pardon me? Federalist paper. Yeah, they're up there. As a matter of fact, you can actually see Federalist right there. Yeah. I tried to make it easy for everybody. Well, I'll tell you. Nope, nope. It, it, so a, a, a Mobius strip is a continuum of a relative surface. Mobius strip press is a continuum of a relative concept and and what I'm trying to talk about here is individual liberty and sovereignty and this particular document right there was the beginning in civilized society known as the Magna Carta in 1215 where actually people and the king acknowledged individual sovereignty of the of the citizens so I there you go that's why I don't do this that often but I actually had a homeschooler get this <laughs> so anyway hats off to homeschooling if there's no other questions, thank you so much. I really appreciate you spending your opportunity cost here. Yep. Thank, thank you, you very much.